And thank you for the invitation to be here today. And I'm amazed at how many people there are here. Stavros kept telling me, I'm not sure how many people will come. It's a bank holiday weekend, but it's a pleasure to see so many of you. And I've been asked today to talk about the management of female urinary incontinence. So this is where I come from. This is King's College Hospital. It's over 100 years old. It's a brick building in a relatively socially deprived area in southeast London. And it's where Stavros did most of his uh, early training. And about 10 years ago, we were moved into this new building uh, where urogynecology is housed right in the center of the building. And I head up um, a biggish urogynecology department with four consultants, three doctors in training, three specialist nurses, and two dedicated physiotherapists. And we have a very nice multidisciplinary team. And today I'm going to talk to you about urinary incontinence. And as you're all aware, it's a very common problem affecting about 30 to 35% of adult women, 5% of whom are severely affected. Prolapse is even more common. And by the age of 80, 11% of women will have had an operation for either prolapse or urinary incontinence, with almost a third of them requiring repeat surgery. And the prevalence of urinary incontinence increases with increasing age, and this has sinister implications now with our aging population. And although it increases overall in prevalence, the type of incontinence changes. So while stress incontinence is most common in the uh, middle-aged years and around the time of the menopause, urgency urinary incontinence and mixed incontinence become more prevalent with increasing age. Now, the International Consultation on Incontinence met for the fifth time in Paris in 2012. And the work of 23 committees and over 200 participants ended up producing guidelines for the management of urinary incontinence in women. And based on this, they divided incontinence into its initial management for straightforward incontinence and then more specialized management. And the advice given is that basic uh, non-invasive treatment can be given on the basis of a history and examination and clinical findings alone so that women are divided on um, whether they have stress incontinence, incontinence on effort, urgency incontinence, incontinence with frequency and urgency into two broad categories and then given non-invasive methods of treatment. However, if you're going to go on and operate on patients or have other expensive and irreversible types of treatment, then you need further evaluation. And for these women, you need to assess their prolapse, you need to consider imaging, you need to consider urodynamics prior to making an objective diagnosis and offering invasive treatment. So the initial assessment of any woman with incontinence should include a review of their symptoms and particularly their bothersomeness and how much they impact on quality of life. You need to consider not only urinary symptoms, but also bowel and sexual symptoms. And you need to consider any exacerbating comorbidities uh, and other conditions. Abdominal examination is important, the skin condition because of uh, excoriation or atrophy, and a pelvic examination to include prolapse and pelvic floor strength. You also need to consider aspects of a woman's general life and well-being. Is she manually dexterous? Could she manage to self-catheterize? Is she able to access toilet facilities in time? And finally, of course, does she want treatment or does she just want to be reassured that there's nothing seriously wrong with her? When investigations are required, they range from the very simple, non-invasive tests such as frequency volume charts and urine cultures through assessment of urinary residual urodynamics and cystoscopy. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to divide incontinence into the two broad groups and talk first of all about stress urinary incontinence and then secondly about the overactive bladder. So stress incontinence is the most prevalent type of incontinence. It affects more than 50% of women who complain of urinary leakage and it can be classified in two ways. Symptomatically, it's the complaint of involuntary loss of urine on effort or physical exertion or on sneezing or coughing. And objectively, when urodynamics are carried out, it's the involuntary leakage of urine during filling systometry associated with increased intra-abdominal pressure in the absence of a detrusor contraction.
So the guidelines suggest to us that the initial treatment of stress, simple stress incontinence should be with supervised pelvic floor muscle training of at least three months duration, and this should be offered to all incontinent women. It's been researched more in stress incontinence than mixed or urgency incontinence, but it helps in all forms of incontinence. There's no obvious benefit of adding adjuncts such as biofeedback or cones, but these can help in some women who are unaware of how to contract their pelvic floor muscles. The only drug that has been developed and marketed for stress incontinence is duloxetine. It is actually a good drug. It reduces incontinence episode frequency by up to 60%, but the problem is that it causes side effects, particularly nausea, which stop patients from taking it, uh, and they don't want to persist with this type of uh, intervention long term because they don't really like it. There are some pointers regarding women who will do well from conservative management. Self-motivation is a very important factor for the success of pelvic floor muscle training, and if we look at which women are going to go on to have surgery after pelvic floor muscle training, they're likely to be the younger women, those who are better educated, and those who have more severe stress incontinence before they underwent pelvic floor muscle training. And of course, we all know that we're surgeons, we all like to operate, and the majority of patients will eventually have surgery for stress incontinence. So surgery is appropriate when conservative or medical treatment has failed, when we've made a definitive diagnosis of urodynamic stress incontinence, and when we've counseled patients appropriately, considering each operation, its potential success and failure rates, and the complications which may occur. And it's important that women request surgery, not that we force it upon them. There are two different approaches to surgical intervention for stress incontinence. The traditional approach was to elevate the bladder, neck, and proximal urethra and bring them into the intra-abdominal pressure zone uh, and to align the bladder, neck to the back of the pubic symphysis and in some cases to increase outflow resistance. In the 1990s, Petros and Olmsten proposed the integral theory of urinary incontinence, which states that stress incontinence results from failure of the pubourethral ligaments in the mid-urethra. And surgical treatment has changed considerably over recent years. In 2008, Paul Hilton looked at the changes over the previous decade. He showed the overall number of operations for incontinence was increasing, and there was a shift between the different procedures. So the annual number of operations was up by 28%. There was a 90% reduction in the number of colpo suspensions, 50% reduction in bladder neck, buttress, sling, and urethral bulking procedures, and this was mainly due to the mid-urethral tapes. Now, I think you'll find this slide interesting because this slide shows the evolution of continent surgery. And for many of you in the audience, you'll recognize the names on the left-hand side of the map. But perhaps you're not so familiar with the right-hand sided names. And what happened in the 1990s was we stopped calling the operation by the surgeon who invented it, and we started to call the operation by the device that the manufacturers produced to do the operation. So I think you might be more familiar with the names on the right, and you will see that none of them are named after a surgeon. They're all named after a manufacturer's device, including the two latest advents on the market. So we have to be very careful when we select our surgery for the patient. We want to do what's in her best interest and not have industry-driven devices guide us. The colpo suspension is still a good operation. It has objective and subjective cure rates in excess of 80%, and it's got a grade A recommendation for the treatment of both primary and recurrent stress incontinence. And it's obviously a useful operation to do when other intra-abdominal surgery is planned. But the colpo suspension is a big operation. It's carried out through a major fan and steel incision. Uh, the aerotropubic space is opened. The paravaginal fascia is dissected by pushing the bladder base and bladder neck medially off the vagina. And the vagina is then suspended with a series of sutures to the ipsilateral iliopectineal ligament. And this requires several days in hospital and several weeks off work. So the colpo suspension can be carried out laparoscopically. If it's carried out in exactly the same way with the same number of sutures, there's no reason why the results should be any different, but it actually isn't cost effective as compared to the open procedure. 
And are we doing it for cosmetic reasons? If so, perhaps it's the wrong thing to do. In a study carried out nearly 20 years ago, women were asked which they preferred, laparoscopic incisions or a famine steel incision, and these were 50 patients and 50 female staff within a hospital, and two-thirds preferred a famine steel incision cosmetically to laparoscopic incisions. In fact, for those who'd had a previous caesarean section, 80% preferred to have another famine steel incision rather than additional laparoscopic incisions. <laughs> So we now have the TVT. Now, it was the first of the mid-urethral tapes, and its use is based on the integral theory. It was originally described performed under local anesthesia, but it's now more frequently performed under regional block or general anesthetic. It's a vaginal approach using a macroporous type 1 polypropylene mesh. And these are the five-year data from Hilton and Ward comparing the TVT with the Colpo suspension, and you can see there were no major differences in outcome at five years, a slight difference in complication rate. More patients who had a Colpo suspension required redo surgery for prolapse. More patients in the tape group required further surgery for tape complications, but otherwise there was no difference at five years. And we now have 17-year data from the Scandinavians. They were able to find 58 of their original 90 patients and showed that they still had um, a subjective cure rate of nearly 80%, and nearly all of them would recommend the operation to a friend. While the Scandinavians were developing the retropubic tapes, the French started to develop the transobturator tapes. And these were designed to avoid the complications associated with entering the retropubic space. They go through the obturator muscle. Once again, they can be performed under general, regional, or local anesthesia. They have less operating time. And initially, it was thought that a cystoscopy wasn't required. However, we now know that for women with a big cystocele, they should have a cystoscopy. Interesting that if you look at the data from the Parisian hospitals, by, 1990, by 2006, over 95% of their procedures for stress incontinence were actually obturator tapes. Is there any difference between the outside in tapes and the inside out tapes? The only difference is in the damage or the, the um, erosion into the vaginal angle. So vaginal angle injuries are greater with the outside in route than the inside out route. Otherwise, the efficacy and the complications are exactly the same. Is there any difference between the retropubic tapes and the um, obturator tapes? Well, the cure rates are exactly the same, but bladder injuries and voiding difficulties are greater with TVTs, groin injuries and thigh pain, and vaginal injuries are greater with the obturator tapes. And there has now been a Cochrane systematic review, and what it shows is that the retropubic tapes bottom up, like the TVT, are more favorable than the top down, that monofilament tapes are preferable to multifilament tapes, that the obturator route has probably a lower objective cure, although quality of life is the same, but there are less complications with the obturator route in terms of bladder perforation. Of course, tapes do fail because we know that no operation is 100% foolproof, and a variety of different procedures have been carried out and reported in very small short-term series regarding what people do when tapes fail. Unfortunately, there's no robust evidence to recommend any different type of procedure, and often nowadays people are putting in a repeat tape. There was one small study which looked at repeat tape versus tape tightening, and repeat tape is more um, acceptable and efficacious than tightening the tape. And if we look at what people do in clinical practice, I subscribe to the British Society of Urogynecology database where we register all our information regarding our pelvic floor surgery. And for repeat surgery, you will see that in the UK, uh, the majority of people are putting in a repeat tape, either retropubic or transobturator. Very few are doing bulking agents or birch colpo suspensions. Most recently, the mini slings have come into use. They're single incision tapes, eight centimeters long, and they have no exit point. The aim was to reduce morbidity. They require less dissection, and the potential was that they would be used in an outpatient setting under local anesthesia. And initially, there were some promising short-term results. We were just about to start using mini tapes when we saw this report in 2010, 
showing that actually the success rate is lower than we would expect from the traditional midurethral tapes, and the complication rate is higher than we would like in an outpatient setting. And there's now been a good systematic meta-analysis that has looked at single incision mini slings compared to standard midurethral slings, and it's shown that the cure rate is less with the mini slings, although the operative time and the day one pain scores are also less, but you're more likely to need repeat surgery if you have a mini sling than a standard sling. And in this series, you are more likely to have de novo urgency. So what is the role for mini slings at the moment? Well, in the UK, the recommendation is that they should only be carried out in a research setting or on a national registry, and their current evidence does not support their use in clinical practice. Uh, interestingly, uh, Johnson & Johnson have withdrawn their TBT Secure from the market along with many of their other mesh products, although there are still other mini slings available. And in the two most recent randomized controlled trials, both of the mini slings did worse than the standard midurethral slings. And it does lead us to wonder, is this because of the learning curve? because they're relatively new? Is it because of the method of fixation? And at the moment, we only have short-term follow-up. And we do have to be very careful when we give women tapes about the information that we give them. There are now numerous websites advising women that tapes are bad, like TVT No and TVT Mum. And all of them warn about the dangers of tapes and have led to the FDA revising their guidelines regarding the use of all meshes because of the litigation which is arising, particularly in the United States of America, in relation to synthetic implants. For less invasive surgery, well, periurethral bulking agents have advantages and disadvantages. They are truly minimally invasive. They can truly be performed under local anesthesia in the clinic setting. They have low morbidity, low levels of voiding difficulty and of protrusor overactivity, and they're suitable for women with intrinsic sphincter deficiency and with comorbidities. However, they have a lower efficacy than the midurethral tapes. There are few long-term data. They often need to be repeated, uh, and that makes them rather more expensive. The one that we're using at the moment is microparticulate silicon or macroplastique. It's been around for a long time, and we've been using it quite comfortably for a significant number of years now. You do have to be very careful which agent you pick because two of them have been withdrawn because of complications. And unfortunately, collagen, which many of us used to use, is no longer available because the herd of cows from which it has, was made have died out and it's too expensive to replace them. So periurethral bulking agents have been used now for over 30 years. There are about 10 substances still in use. They all have what appears to be the same grade of efficacy, but if we look at the Cochrane Review, there's no consensus regarding how often they should be used, where they should be injected, how much should be injected, or any other outcomes. And in the future, perhaps we'll be using stem cells as an injectable. A recent report last year carried out a randomized controlled trial comparing autologous myoblasts, which were implanted into the external urethral sphincter, they used both high cell count and low cell count and compared it to both placebo and duloxetine. The stem cell injections were no different from duloxetine and both were superior to placebo. So maybe in the future, stem cell research will lead to better injectable agents. I thought you'd just be interested to hear the long-term results of surgery because we don't really know very much about it. And these are healthcare claims from the United States of America from 2000 to 2009, over 155,000 women. 82% of them had midurethral slings. If you look, the need for repeat surgery overall was 14.5%, and you can see the relative need for surgery with bulking agent slings and the birch colpo suspension. But if you adjust for age, year of surgery, the region of the United States, and then the overall need for repeat surgery was 28% higher with midurethral slings than colpo suspensions. So colpo suspension is still a good operation. What do we advise? Well, <coughs> the colpo suspension is a durable operation. <coughs> there are good long-term data. It can be combined with abdominal surgery, and it's useful if there's a cystocele 
in addition to incontinence. But it is major surgery, <coughs> and it may predispose towards a rectocele. The TVT is durable. There are long-term data. It's carried out as a day case procedure with a vaginal approach. It's relatively safe, although it does risk bladder injury and, in the longer term, tape erosions. The TOT, there are now medium-term data. It's also a day case procedure with a vaginal route, and it avoids the retropubic space. But in some patients, there can be very troublesome leg or groin pain, and it risks urethral injury or vaginal injuries. The mini slings are ambulatory, and they avoid the retropubic space, but there are very few data, short-term results, and a high failure rate. And bulking agents have the lowest morbidity, minimally invasive, ambulatory, good for intrinsic sphincter deficiency in women with comorbidities, but less efficacy, cost more because of repeat injections and possible failures. So I shall move on now to talk about the overactive bladder syndrome. So the overactive bladder syndrome is a symptom complex. It's not based on any underlying diagnosis, and it is urinary urgency, usually accompanied by frequency and nocturia, with or without urgency urinary incontinence in the absence of urinary tract infection or other obvious cause. And if we want to make a urodynamic diagnosis, it's an observation characterized by involuntary detrusor contractions during the filling phase, which may be spontaneous or provoked. And that's referred to as detrusor overactivity. So the two are different. But urgency is the cardinal symptom of the overactive bladder syndrome. And it's urgency that drives the other symptoms. So about two-thirds of people who have an overactive bladder are continent or dry, and about one-third are incontinent or wet. In those who are continent, urgency makes frequency more common, and in those who are incontinent, it leads to urgency incontinence, both of which are troublesome in their own right. And once again, the overactive bladder is a common condition affecting over 16% of adults over the age of 40. Interestingly, it's just about as prevalent in men as it is in women, uh, but men don't become incontinent, so in many ways it's less troublesome. It's underdiagnosed, and when it is diagnosed, it's undertreated, and it leads to significant comorbidities. And it's a disease that changes over time. Ian Milson's group in Gothenburg studied women in 1991 and again in 2007, and they showed that of those without overactive bladder, by 17 years later, 20% had an overactive bladder. Of those who were overactive bladder dry in 1991, half of them had either resolved or been treated adequately, and half remained dry, the other half were now wet. And of those who were overactive bladder wet, more than half still were, but of the others, half had resolved and half were now overactive bladder dry. But I don't want you to leave here thinking that the only causes of urgency and frequency in women are an overactive bladder, because of course there are many different causes of these common symptoms, and some are as simple as physiological changes of pregnancy. So there are many causes of urgency and frequency. And when patients do have an overactive bladder, their goal is to resolve all of the symptoms, but particularly urgency. So the treatment that we have to offer ranges from the very simple to the highly complex lifestyle advice through to reconstructive surgery. From the Fifth International Consultation on Incontinence, as well as other guidelines, we should in offer lifestyle intervention in the first instance. And the first thing we should do is make women drink less. There's been a trend over recent years to drink more and more and more water and really the only people it's good for are the manufacturers of mineral water. And by a simple reduction of 25% fluid intake, you can improve the symptoms of urgency, frequency, and nocturia. Caffeine is also a risk factor. Tea is probably worse than coffee because of the volume. Um, and also the caffeine that is in uh, sweetened um, drinks is worse with artificially sweetened sodas than it is with naturally sweetened sodas with sugar. And weight loss is also an independent risk factor for all forms of incontinence and for overactive bladder. When lifestyle interventions are not enough, then we should look at pelvic floor muscle training, which I said already was good for urgency incontinence as well as stress incontinence, and particularly bladder retraining. And our national guidelines dictate that we should offer six weeks minimum of bladder retraining as first-line therapy. Um, Bladder retraining can be improved or enhanced if drugs are given at the same time, 
And it's often the case that women will have both bladder retraining and drug therapy simultaneously. Complementary therapies of acupuncture and hypnotherapy have both been tried, and they've both been shown to be effective in small series, but unfortunately they're very time consuming and the relapse rate is high, so they're not widely available. And the majority of women who have an overactive bladder will have drug therapy. So after lifestyle changes and behavioral intervention, antimuscarinic agents are the most widely used therapy for the overactive bladder. They work by reducing the pressure within the bladder, increasing bladder compliance, raising the threshold for micturition, uh, and reducing uninhibited contractions. So for those of you who do urodynamics, they move the system metrogram trace to the right. And it's been a very e an interesting evolution to antimuscarinic medication. In the 1970s and 1980s, we only had um, oxybutynin immediate release, which is now a generic preparation. In the 1990s and into 2000, we had the advent of trospium, propivirine, tolteridine, and we started to see extended release formulations. But within the last decade, we've seen a huge increase in the number of antimuscarinics available, and they have slightly different modes of action, but they are all antimuscarinics. We now have extended release formulations of oxybutynin, tolteridine, propivirine, and trospium. We have the selective M3 antagonists of solifenacin and darifenacin, the more bladder selective agent of fesoteridine, and we have alternative delivery systems for oxybutynin, the patch. The gel is available in America, but not in Europe. Intravicycle oxybutynin, and there's even an intravaginal oxybutynin ring. But unfortunately, the side effects for all of them remain the same, and many patients stop taking these medications because of a dry mouth and constipation. As long as goes 1997, Con Kelleher showed that by six months, less than 20% of women were still taking antimuscarinics for overactive bladder. And if we look at the reason for this, lack of symptom relief is uh, the most common cause, but side effects is the second most common cause. And there have been studies now which have looked at factors which affect patient adherence to medication. So efficacy, side effects, frequency of administration and route of administration, and patient factors, patient expectations, their that whether they think they need medication, their cultural beliefs and their education. And many times the doctors are not good at counseling patients at the beginning of their treatment or following them up when they've started treatment. However, the Fifth International Consultation on Incontinence gives all of the available branded antimuscarinics a grade A recommendation for use based on good clinical trial data. So what do we use in clinical practice? Well, they have various advantages and disadvantages. Oxybutin in immediate release is the cheapest. It's flexible dosing, it's rapid onset, but because of the side effect of a very severe dry mouth, no one persists with using it long term. Extended release oxybutynin is flexible dosing and is probably the best medication for neurogenic detrusor overactivity, but in the elderly it can lead to cognitive impairment. The transdermal systems are more um, effective in terms of lack of side effects, but the patch can cause pruritus, which is unfortunate because it can't be used after that. Tolteridine was the market leader for many years. It's well tolerated but often lacks efficacy as it's only available in one dose. Solifenacin was shown in the STAR study to be superior to tolteridine, but has a dry mouth at the higher dose. Darifenacin, low cognitive impairment rate, so good for the elderly, but high constipation rate, making it bad for the elderly. Trospium chloride doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, but unfortunately is only available in a single dose in its extended release formulation. Propivirine not widely used because it's only ever been shown to be effective for frequency. And fesoteridine, flexible dosing, but once again at the higher dose, a high side effect profile of dry mouth. The Cochrane Review looked at trials which had compared two different antimuscarinics, and basically tolteridine immediate release is better tolerated than oxybutynin. The long-acting preparations are better tolerated than the short-acting drugs. Solifenacin is superior to tolteridine in the um, one head-to-head -head study that's been carried out. And fesoteridine was more acceptable to patients in the lower dose, but in the higher dose, the withdrawal rate was higher. <laughs>
So we have to balance efficacy to relieve symptoms with tolerability to produce minimal side effects to allow adherence and persistence and maximize the duration of therapy. And now we have a new class of drug, the beta-3 adrenoreceptor agonist, Mirabigron. There are two other um, beta-3 agonists in development, but it's only Mirabigron that has come to market. And the difference with this drug is it's a different class of therapy. It's not an anti-muscarinic medication, and it works on the sympathetic rather than the parasympathetic pathways. There have been two large phase three studies. Both showed exactly the same. This is the American study, but the European study had exactly the same reduction in the number of incontinence episodes and reduction in frequency of micturition as compared to placebo with minimal side effects. And this is the first drug for overactive bladder that has a side effect profile similar to placebo. Now, not, any of the, not all of these drugs are going to be suitable for everybody, and sometimes there are special instances when you need to have drugs to treat specific symptoms. Desmopressin is a synthetic vasopressin analog. It's been used for many years to treat nocturia and nocturnal enuresis in children. It's also been shown to be effective for nocturia in adults, um, but many parts of the world doesn't have a license for that. Uh, but you have to be very careful when you prescribe desmopressin because particularly for women over the age of 65, it can cause fluid retention and hyponatremia. However, it can be used as an ad hoc drug for the overactive bladder. It provides one less void in the first hour, eight hours post-treatment and a decrease in the number of urgency episodes. But of course, there has to be payback because if you're going to have antidiuresis, then you have to have diuresis at another time. In some parts of the world where um, the branded drugs are not available, antidepressants such as imipramine or amitriptyline are still used uh, and can be very useful. Once again, particularly useful at night because their side effect profile is not very good in the daytime. Hormone replacement therapy over the last decade or so has been highly contentious. We used to think that you could treat incontinence with systemic estrogens. We now know from the most recent Cochrane review that systemic administration of estrogens can result in worse incontinence than placebo. However, local estrogens are entirely different. They work in a different way, and they can improve incontinence and other lower urinary tract symptoms. One study that compared the vaginal estradiol ring, S-string, with oral oxybutynin showed that the improvement in both groups was exactly the same, and there was no significant difference between the two groups. There have also been two studies that have looked at vaginal estrogen together with um, tolteridine. This one in the management of the overactive bladder showed an improvement in frequency and quality of life when the two were used synergistically, um, but no difference in the other symptoms. This study that looked at women only with the choose or overactivity showed no difference between those women having tolteridine and those women having tolteridine with vaginal estriol. We now have botulinum toxin available with a license for idiopathic overactive bladder. The initial um, randomized controlled trial, the RELAX study, showed improvement in all symptoms of the overactive bladder using 200 international units of botulinum toxin. However, at this dose, there's quite a high rate of urinary, infection, uh, urinary retention leading to urinary tract infections and requiring clean intermittent self-catheterization. There's now been a recent report of using 100 international units, half the recommend, previously recommended dose, and this showed significant improvement on all symptoms and quality of life, and only 6% of the patients required clean intermittent self-catheterization, and efficacy appeared to be maintained over repeat treatments. So we also have a grade A recommendation for botulinum toxin and for desmopressin for nocturia. There are new drugs in development. Some of them look quite promising, but perhaps the way in the future is going to be combination therapies. And certainly there's a, a preparation being researched now that combines an anti-muscarinic with a beta-3 agonist. When drugs don't work uh, and botulinum toxin isn't uh, available or doesn't work either, then we can move on to consider uh, neuromodulation. There used to be three systems, but the patient-managed system has been withdrawn by Johnson & Johnson, so we now have peripheral tibial nerve stimulation and sacral neuromodulation. 
Although peripheral tibial nerve stimulation has been available since the 1980s, it wasn't until very recently that a large American study and a large European study showed that actually PTNS is as effective, if not more effective, than drug therapy, although perhaps not as cost effective, and it does have to be repeated over time. The systematic review showed about a 60% subjective and objective success rate using PTNS, uh, and there's now one small long-term study which shows that at three years, patients are still uh, having an improvement in their symptoms if it's topped up every month or so. Uh, a new implantable PTNS device is also being researched at present, which would mean that patients wouldn't have to keep coming back to the hospital. Sacral neuromodulation has also been around since the late 1990s, and initially the results were very promising, but if you look at any of the longer-term series, you'll see that nearly 50% require revision by five years, that by 15 years, the success rate and the patients that are still using their implants is quite small. Surgery is not normally recommended for the overactive bladder, and when it is, it's major reconstructive surgery, which is usually carried out by the urologists, and it really is a last resort because it's not without its complications. How do we manage the overactive bladder? Well, our initial, initial management is patients are invited to go to a class with other women where they're given a lecture and uh, it, the mechanism of the overactive bladder is explained to them. If they attend the class, they're then given a one-to-one -one follow-up appointment where they have lifestyle advice and bladder retraining, and if appropriate, an appointment with the physiotherapist. Then they are given anti-muscarinic medication and that's based very much on patient choice and the type of patient because not one medication suits all. If that fails, we usually give them an alternative um, anticholinergic or we may consider an alternative route of administration or an alternative class of drug. When that fails, we offer botulinum toxin or PTNS. In our hospital, we don't do sacral neuromodulation, but we do refer them out. Very rarely reconstructive surgery and occasionally a long-term catheter, suprapubic being better than urethral. So to conclude then, for stress incontinence, the first-line treatment is pelvic floor muscle training. The trend with regard to surgery is less invasive surgery with reduced morbidity, shorter hospital stay, and a quicker return to work. The TVT and colpo suspension appear to have similar cure rates, and we now have 17-year data for the TVT although we do have to caution women about the possibility of long-term complications, including mesh erosion. And there are many tapes available, but not all tapes are the same, and I suggest that you should use the one with the best data regarding efficacy and lack, lack of complications. And injectables form a very useful adjunct to our armamentarium, particularly for older people and with comorbidities. For the overactive bladder, conservative therapy is indicated initially, Antimuscarinics are most commonly prescribed, but unfortunately, persistence is limited by tolerability and efficacy. In the future, we may have better drugs and drug combinations, and we need to tailor our treatment to suit the individual woman. Neuromodulation and botulinum toxin are both available for patients who fail to succeed with drug therapy, and reconstructive surgery or a catheter should only be considered after everything else has failed. And I'd like to thank my team of urogynecologists, some of whom are shown here at the recent IUGA meeting in Dublin, because they're working in my outpatients clinic while I've come to talk to you today. Thank you very much.